episode number 94, Our Man Lake Placid with Amy Von Tassel. Welcome to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. I'm Coach Terry Wilson, and with each episode, I bring stories of athletes to you that share their experiences at races in order for you to learn how to have your perfect race. We will hear stories from athletes of all ages, abilities, and races of all distances. So regardless of where you fit in, there's something in there for you. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let the pursuit begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to my friend and professional triathlete Amy Von Tassel about her recent race experience at Ironman Lake Placid in beautiful upstate New York, where she had a time of 10 hours, 54 minutes, 31 seconds. She's been racing triathlons for the past 12 years, with the last two being as a professional triathlete. This race took place on July 22nd, 2018, with the temperature on race day being 46 and rising to 79. The water temperature was 74 degrees as well. Also notable to mention about this year's race at Lake Placid, it was pouring rain and it also had some hail on the bike ride. Welcome to the show, Amy. I look forward to hearing about your race experience at Lake Placid. Thanks, Terry. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So what made you want to do this race in the first place? I have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. Um, The... The, my favorite answer is that it is one of the most gnarly, if not the gnarliest, Ironman left in North America. In a day where courses are getting a little flatter and maybe even a little shorter so people can get those sexy PRs, um, Lake Placid is not only not a PR course, but I personally was about an hour off of uh, my goal time. And so uh, it was um, refreshing to stare down a race that was just going to be tough and gritty and fun and hard. Wow. Now, going into this race here, did you prepare yourself a certain way for this race? Yeah, Lake Placid, um, on that same note, is going to be more hilly than any race I stare down this whole year. And so um, so strength was a big issue. Uh, it, it's a uh, liability for me in general. I'm not as uh, physically, muscularly strong as my competitors. And so um, there was some early um, leg strength uh, muscle training and um, some hill work going into this race that probably I wouldn't have done for other. Okay. Now, going into this race, I know you're with Chris Bag Coaching, obviously. I think that's just Mm -hmm. a given by just who you are and your relationship to him. How was he setting up your plan to give you the most success on race day? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, it's just so wonderful to be able to rely on a plan and have a coach and know that I can just um, look at the schedule every week and um, know that he's cognizant of Lake Placid. He's done the course before and he is very individualized among his athletes based on what, not only what distances um, they're, they're staring down and approaching and their relative strengths and weaknesses, but the exact courses. And so he has quite different training plans for each of his athletes. And for me in Lake Placid, um, there were was that hell work and then um, my favorite way to prepare for a race is through events leading up to a race um like maybe b races um uh and um the cycling being my weakest leg uh i did a couple long and hard and very hilly bike races and bike events um to build up that uh to build up that um endurance and uh and strength okay so what was your longest swim, bike, and runs going into Lake Placid? I err on the longer side. In fact, my coach has to rein me in because um, I, uh, I've i done Ultraman in the past. I'm more of the uh, endurance monster. Uh, I don't have a lot of fast twitch. Um, and so I had a 140-mile ride was probably my longest. Um, I'm sure I did one or maybe even two 10 K swims. Um, but again, that I'm pretty comfortable doing that. And where coach really had to reel me in is I couldn't do any of my long trail runs that I've done in years past. And I think I only, my longest run was probably 20 miles. Um, in the past I've done longer, but, um, there, you just can't recover from, from that volume. So coach really reined me in there. Okay. Now, Going into this race, were you doing a lot of bricks in training? Yeah, you know, I always have to do bricks. I didn't used to, um, but now more and more each year, um, just jumping up to the professional level and how different and hard it is, um, I – 
I try to, and coach has me after almost every long run, always run, or sorry, after every long ride, always run. Um, sometimes it's only 20 minutes. Sometimes it's a 10 K sometimes it's an hour, but every long ride, always put your sneakers right on after the bike. Um, that's been new in these past few years for me. Okay. Now, were you doing a lot of strength training in the actual training program or was that tapered off at a certain point in your training? What does that look like? Yeah, it's very specific and it's usually limited to December, January, February. Um, and then it wanes off not only because I'm kind of more traveling and racing, um, but also because um, maybe you don't want to tear up your muscles that much. Um, but there, there was some, some grueling weights and squats in the gym uh, in January uh, to try to bulk me up so that my legs look a little bit more muscular like Rachel McBride's. <laughs> now, whenever you're training all these long hours on the bike and on the run, what are you using for nutrition? That has been quite a journey, and I have come all around. Um, when I was training for Ultraman, um, since my watts and my intensity could be lower because I was, it's you know, more long distance based, I essentially ate anything I wanted to, anything that sounded good that wasn't too crazy. It had some nutritional value and, and energy in it, like do all sugars. Um, and uh, the best go-to is a classic power bar program. They've got everything you need. A classic power bar has a couple different sugars and salts and they're simple and they're easy. Uh, power gels are the only ones that are salty enough. Some of them have caffeine, which I love. Um, so the power bar is sweet of nutrition has always worked for me. Um, the, recently, um, I've been trying to attack some issues that I've had in races um, with having to go to the bathroom a lot. That's really inhibited my performances uh, a lot. Um, I did wildflower short course. Um, it was actually long course. It's a half iron uh, in May and I had to stop five times for a long time. And I And coach and I thought, this is it. We got to change some things. So um, I have been looking towards field work nutrition for their smoothie program and looking towards um, fueling up on low FODMAP. That's an acronym for uh, foods that don't upset your stomach as much um, for the 48 hours before a race. And it's worked. Uh, these pat I've had two recent races where I have not had stomach issues as I have in the past. And I'm elated. So what foods is it that upsets your stomach and upsets your body before the race? Yeah, the, the answer is that I don't know. And so instead of being able to empirically try everything and see what doesn't work, I've been trying to keep it simple and see what does work. And um, there's, a, uh, in, uh, there's a brilliant nutritionist whom you might know who leads QT2 Systems. His name is Jesse Kropelnicki. And um, he, I have been on his program, uh, which uh, for most athletes entails a lot of applesauce in the morning before a race. And I decided to depart from that. Sorry, Jesse. Um, and I've been going to um, a lot of potatoes and simple starches and um, then using the um, field work nutrition company uh, Primo Smoothie Blend um, to to fill in all the corners uh, in the 48 hours leading up to race. And it's been it's been wonderful. OK, now it seems like the potatoes and the applesauce are kind of like staples for a lot of athletes and yeah. that seems like is the case here and i like how that you wanted to back into what works versus what doesn't work yeah so I, I like that approach very very good now if we take a look at your training over the past few weeks and months what was the most hours that you trained in one week you know, not that much. Some athletes put in 30 hours, 30 hour weeks, some brag about 40 hour weeks. Um, but endurance is not a problem for me. Um, I come from an endurance background, strength and intensity and fast twitch and being fast enough. That's my liability. And so my biggest weeks have been Oh, 25, maybe 30, but not too many of those. Um, usually around 20, 
for my my bigger weeks, um, which is a departure from the past where I'd love to just spend hours and hours and hours. Um, but that wasn't getting me anywhere. And so my coach has been focusing on, great, you'll do a long ride. Maybe it'll be over a century, but there better be work in there that's power-based. And that's going to be way more valuable than bragging about a 30-hour week. And so that's been um, a nice departure okay. as well. Now, knowing that you're training more than 20 hours a week some weeks, were there any days we just mentally didn't want to train? Um, always, <laughs> always. Um, and then conversely, sometimes the more you train, the more kind of psycho you get and you feel hyper if you don't train, which I see a lot. Um, the solution for me, I've always found is um, my husband and I both, we change up our training scenes a lot and we have the great fortune to be able to travel. And so I think I'm immune to getting in ruts because I'm changing up my environment so much, including I attended um, three training camps this spring, um, which, as you know, just, just exponentially boosts your motivation uh, and keeps your head in the game to be around a bunch of different people with a coach program. Um, and so that was the key to my saving off burnout um, this spring was um, changing up the scene for training, not just racing, but uh, destination training. Okay. Now, being that you have done Ultraman and you've done multiple Ironman and half Ironmans galore, mm -hmm. We know that you have the ability to stay in your head for really long periods of time and being able to push for even longer periods of time. How did you develop this trait, so to speak? It might be that I'm just not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, I used to just kind of like the um, the grittiness of it and um, the uh, uh, facing down barriers and going for one more hour. But it is actually, to me, getting kind of increasingly boring um, these, these past few years where I haven't wanted to go out and face down a 120-mile bike by myself because I think that's just so boring. Today, I'm just coming back. I have wet hair from um, from a longer swim, open water, beautiful lake I get to swim in. But it's pretty boring, you know, by yourself looking down at nothing. Um, and so I don't know if my mental fortitude is staying the same. I think it might be getting weaker. But fortunately, I have um, made an effort to seek out, to not fall into that and fall victim to it. I can't do that ride because I'm too bored. That you you that can never be an excuse. Go find a way to not be bored. Whether it's listening to a podcast for me, it's for uh, signing up for events, even if they're B races or camps or something to keep it stimulating. Um, and so for me, I when I when I think I might be facing down some mental fatigue, then I don't try to change my brain. I just change the setting. Um, so, okay. You think you're going to be bored this weekend? Go do a grand fondo somewhere. Do it on your gravel bike. See if your coach says that's okay. And so that's how I've been facing down those demons recently. Okay. Now it seems like that you objectively see your thoughts and address them as an objective person with the thoughts being separate from you. Ooh, I think you're right. I might've just realized that. <laughs> I think you're right because I think we could we could try to change our thought process or berate ourselves for being bored. Um, but I don't I don't know. I think instead of spending time trying to change your brain and your uh, perspective, um, that you should um, put everything in place that you can for training to set up your best training day every day. Every day, you know, not just for an A race, not just for a key workout, um, but do the things for yourself so that you don't have to do battle with the demons in your head. Right. Um, and we all have so many resources out there that it should be possible. Okay. Now, in regards to your training, I know you're pro and you've been doing this for a dozen years. So when was the last time that you actually found the bottom of your barrel, so to speak? 
Oh, isn't that a great question? Um, I it w- it would be Ultraman last year, that bottom of the barrel, d- dissolute, I don't care about anything, crying, tantrum, breakdown. Um, in on the run in Ultraman last year, which took place, I did the one in uh, Ultra 520K in Penticton, British Columbia. On the run, um, I had multiple breakdowns, and one of them, I sat down in the middle of the road, crossed my legs, crossed my arms, chucked a water bottle at my coach and cried and said, I don't want to do any of this anymore. I can't. I can't go on physically. My legs hurt so much, and I hate this sport. And I don't know why I'm here. I don't, you know, you know, and insert the rest of my dialogue there. Um, but I would call that a, a, the bottom. <laughs> I right? would call that the bottom. Now, for new athletes that are constantly pushing hard and pushing with bigger volume weeks and, like, wanting to get to the next level, yeah. do you feel like it's necessary at some point along the way to find the bottom? That's a great question. Um, probably. Um, and if the bottom might look like something different for everyone. It could be a little bottom. It could be they showed up for masters and they think this is awful. I hate waking up this early. I hate my lane mates. I hate this. Why am I doing this? Um, and then if they dive in and they get through half the workout and then they do three quarters, that's a victory. Um, and so maybe that was like a little rock bottom, um, but the overcoming it, man, that's where the triumphs occur. And I'm convinced those rock bottoms and those triumphs happen more in training or, you know, arguably they're as significant in training as they are in racing because for people like athletes trying to get better and add volume, maybe go to the next level, I really invite them to consider this. There are 365 days in a year. They might have, let's say they have one A race, like one Ironman, maybe two. Um, Those are two days. The rest of, let's say, 350 or so days are training. That's the life that they signed on for. They might think they signed on for doing Placid and maybe going to Kona or something, but those are two days. They signed on for the 350 plus where they go to masters at 5.30 a.m. and hit rock bottom in a tiny little way. And then they get in and then they have breakfast and then they're better. That's where the beautiful lessons come. Wow. That's very well said. Very well. With your training, what workouts did you do that gave you the confidence to go into Lake Placid 100% prepared? Thank you. I'm confident. Um bike workouts with very hard intervals that are watt based. No question. I'm never going to worry about my swim. It's not very fast, but, um, but I'm very comfortable. I'm never going to worry about my run. Um, I just worry if maybe I'm spending, (laughs) I haven't paid attention to it recently. Um, but I'm the cycling is my liability, not the endurance, but just the power and speed that I don't have. And so when I lose confidence on race day, it usually looks like this. I say, I can never keep up with any of these girls on the bike. Age groupers start passing me. I'm such a bad negative talk. It's all the bike. And so if I can look back to some workouts I did where I think, Oh, I hit big was that day. It was hard, but coach said you got to do three by twenty at these big watts for me. Um, those were the those were the key workouts that I look back to on Ironman race day. And what's funny, you were asking me about this before. They weren't very long bike rides. Um, the ones that were had those intensive power intervals, but those were the ones that I look look to on Ironman race day to give me confidence. Okay. Now, when you're not training, racing, or traveling, what are you doing? Um, I'm making crafts in Portland, Oregon. (laughs) 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 Um, um, My husband and I have um, a small apartment, um, but it's awesome. It's in urban Portland, Oregon, in the middle of the most popular tourist district. Um, and I love living there so much. Um, obviously, um, my race career doesn't pay the bills. Um, 
And so I do have a side gig. Um, I um, got a master's in education and I worked in college admissions forever. And so I currently counsel high school students applying to college on the side and I can do that remotely too. So I'm, pr- I'm pretty lucky to have that as my, um, my, my breadwinner um, and work with like juniors and seniors applying to college. Wow. That's pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> now I know you're married to Chris, right? Mm-hmm. How long y'all been married? I always get this wrong, Terry. Um, I think it's mom. How long have I been married? <laughs> I think it's six years. Okay. <laughs> but we've been together for a long time. We've been together for a decade. That's why I actually forgot. Over a decade. Okay. So how big of an issue is managing the amount of life that you need to have with the amount of training and working all at the same time and being good at balancing all three and giving each one the amount of time needed? Yeah. Yeah. When you find someone who gives you a good answer, please let me know. It's the biggest issue, right? What an issue. Um, I confess, I mainly marvel at um, anyone who has children. That's, that's whom I marvel uh, I, for, in terms of balance, who's you know training at a high level in triathlon. I just can't imagine also having a child, not just for the time, not just for the commitment, but for that um, the um, absent time um, that, would, that must weigh on parents as they're training. That must be a difficult balance. For me, I don't have very many responsibilities. Even my job, I can do remotely. So I don't have that pull. Um, but I will say that, you know, other things go to the wayside and it's, it's constantly, um, it's, it's constantly an issue. Uh, I always call it the trifecta. There's life, there's triathlon training and racing, and then there's sleep. And probably every day, one of those has to give. Right. Every day, something's got right. It's going to be sleep, like yes. <laughs> and and I think if you check in kind of weekly, like okay, have I been sacrificing the sleep too much? Have I been sacrificing the training too much? Have I been sacrificing the family or the work? Um, those check ins are important. And um, speaking of checking in, if someone has a good coach. I, I believe that a good coach can be instrumental in that balance because you're one of the, the jobs of a coach is to be this outside um, analyzer of your life and what how you're balancing things um, to make sure that you don't you know give your that you give yourself a, enough credit and um, that's um, that's a big pleasure in having a coach to help with that balance as well. Okay. Now, as far as this race goes, did you make any sacrifices that you regret going into this race? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, you know, I think people don't talk about this enough in triathlon, and I think it's a big issue. Um, I've been thinking about the issue of socioeconomics. Um, triathlon is a very wealthy sport. Um, I find it um, grossly non-diverse as well. Um, And I don't think enough people talk about this because my instinct when you asked me that was yes, money. I spent a lot of money and that hit me in the gut because, you know, my husband and I have a tight budget. And what if I DNF'd and spent all this money? Um, My mom came with me and sprung for so much money um, to go and help me in Placid. Um, And so, but then I didn't feel like that was an appropriate answer for you. But now I'm thinking, why not? That's what I was thinking is money. And there are a lot of triathletes out there for whom that's not so much of an issue. There are a lot who it is. And I believe that there's a section of society that is not drawn towards triathlon because of the expense. And so that's something that's been on my mind recently. And I wonder if there's a way to approach that or a way to change it. I haven't come up with any answers, but it's definitely been on my mind. It definitely makes sense because it really seems like for someone to be into triathlon, they have to have a higher education. That's almost like a... Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess like a uh, prerequisite. Yeah, prerequisite. There we go. That word. But yeah. it's like you have to have it. Like you have to be in higher education or you have to have some end to it. Right. 
Exactly. Exactly. And I believe the minority in triathlon are, to your point, someone who has, who doesn't have an advanced degree or um, who is struggling financially. I actually don't know a single person who's struggling financially who also races Ironman anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I wonder, the, the bikes are pretty expensive, so there's that. But, um, but um, I, that could be part and parcel. You know, it's like golf. It's like tennis, you know, um, but I, I guess there is a political issue here, too. And that is when you look around on race day and you see that there's um, there's not that much diversity in triathlon. And I just wondered if there was a way to, to, you know, think about that or change that in the future. Right. I mean, I've been to many Ironman races and I'll be at plenty more this year. One of the things that I've noticed is there isn't very many people at the race that are not white. Yep. I mean, that's calling it a, a spade a spade, I mean, that's pretty yep. much it. I mean, I've had very few people in triathlon that I know that aren't. I mean, and I'm fortunate enough to know an amazing guy out of North Carolina named Morgan. That's the first person. And the second person was another amazing guy named Rich Reed out of Atlanta. And they're like unicorns in the sport. They love the sport. They both did Ultraman Florida this year, by the way. Oh, cool. And I both, I interviewed both of them and like, like we didn't really talk about that issue, but it's something yeah. that needs to be addressed. I feel like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit from tr the training aspect, how is your taper going into this race? Oh yeah. Um, not good. <laughs> I, I was waiting for it, Terry. Um, I, um, I, uh, I, I, you know, my coach approaches every athlete differently. And when I got to the professional level, he said, you know, things are going to kind of boost up when you come to this level. And one place you're going to see it, Amy, is um, there's there's not as much of a taper going into Ironman. And that's because um, my fitness has been kind of higher throughout the year more as opposed to maybe five years ago or, or before I would build up to one or two Ironmans in a year. Now it's more plateaued throughout the year. And so my fitness is such that I don't need to taper as much, but, um, um, because of travel and some logistics, I was doing hard workouts four days before placid. Um, but, um, but, uh, it's, it's, it, it was interesting to kind of dabble and try that too. Um, and um, one of the training camps I went to this year um, was more than a week. And so I got to try out that kind of like no taper, doesn't stop, keep it going. And uh, I responded to it well. I felt great on race day. Okay. Now, hard workouts before the actual race the week of, what does that look like for you? shorter and harder um but back to um what i was saying about um the bike and my liability um i was out on the bike doing some intervals um at or above race wattage um le le leading up to just a few days before the race to keep that power nice and high okay um so short but but intensive intervals that makes sense now i know you live in canada when did you actually start traveling to the race venue at Lake Placid? Oh yeah, um, my uh, my whole family has a place in the Adirondacks, so uh, pretty close to Lake Placid, and I'll be doing Ironman Mont Tremblant in three weeks. And so, looking at these two races, um, uh, it w was inevitable. Uh, it was a no brainer to just decide to come and live here with my mom in the Adirondacks um for just about two months so i got it here in placid um i would say 12 days before the race i love to show up at or near a race early i love to get it here as early as possible for any race anywhere well that makes sense now being that you got there early you got some good training in are you glad you got there before the race city came to town basically I always do that. And it's so fun. Um, I was in, uh, you, you get to kind of see everyone show up. And um, I've been, my husband and I have traveled to places like Cozumel up to a month 
before the race and you actually get a little righteous kind of like i own this place i speak spanish i know every corner and then the athletes start coming and you think oh that's right there's a race coming here um, i um i think it's invaluable because um because of logistics too you know bike mechanics um, lodging, incidentals, um, to deal with that stuff as we all have one day or two days before a race because you just landed can be cumbersome. And most importantly, it's anxiety inducing. Um, so the earlier you get there in your bike, you find out your bike is working, get to check out the course. Um, it's, it's a luxury. Gotcha. Now going into this race, you go to the athlete briefing. You have a pro panel athlete briefing you have to go to. How, how was that, and how was the check-in process at the village there? Yeah, this one was um, remarkable. It was unlike anything I've done before because of one chief reason. This was a women's only professional race. It was crazy. How awesome is that? So awesome. <laughs> Um, and so it made it so special because the panel, I saw my friend up on stage, it was only women professionals. Um, they weren't, you know, I went to a women's college. It was like that. You weren't talked over by the men. <laughs> and then we went to the meeting and it was only us women. Um, and uh, by design, they did that so that women got the spotlight. And um, a very, very, very close friend of mine, Heather Jackson, got the spotlight 100% the days before and the day of the race. And that was, that was unprecedented. It was wonderful. And even a banana. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear about the banana? <laughs> yeah, no. oh, my God. oh, yeah. I don't think you could watch the race and not hear the stories of this here banana. When is she going to eat the banana? <laughs> when is she going to eat the banana? <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was so crazy watching that yeah. unfold. Yeah. So yeah. that went well. Now, I know at this race, I was here last year. It's an amazing village. It it really comes together really, really well. Yeah. Everything is really well oiled. I mean, this is the 20th year at Lake Placid. So yep. they've been doing this for a few times. They got things kind of nailed down <laughs> with how things work yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Asterisk there. Um, once you actually got to the day before the race... How was your anxiety levels and what were you doing the day before the race to prepare you mentally for the race the next day? Yeah, great question. I I have done a lot of Ironman distance races. And so I feel like my routine is locked in. But this one was exceptional because one, I had so much family there and it felt like hometown for me. And the, the village is so much fun and family oriented and spirited, as you pointed to, that I felt alarmingly relaxed. I had little to no anxiety, uh, which was alarming in and of itself. <laughs> I had um, I had some bike mechanical issues the day before. Really? Um, you have, I, what happened? Yeah. Um, I, um, my, I, I had to put my, I put my bike together myself because I travel in these awesome, awesome bags um, that separate your frame and wheels, but you have to take everything apart. The rooster box. The rooster bags. They're terrific. Um, and um, so I put my headset together and everything, but I still felt like it was so wobbly that I couldn't even go into arrow. So I had it checked out and a mechanic said, yeah, you've got too much play in your hub. You got you to gotta ride a new wheel. And so thank goodness race day wheels was there. And um, I got to borrow a wheel for the front, but in all of the mechanics putting everything together, I was um, getting brake rub in the front and back and me trying to adjust both brakes. I kept making everything worse. And um, so I had to take it into a mechanic uh, the day before when I was supposed to be racking it. Um, okay. when I was, yeah. Now, what kind of bike are you using? Uh, the best, which is uh, Liv, uh, an affiliate of Giant Bicycles. Um, it's a Liv Avow and it's just perfect. I, I love it. Um, and I'm fancying myself, um, learning more about the mechanics of putting it together and everything. Uh, but I can only do so much. And, um, my good friends at, um, at race day wheels really helped me the day before, uh, right on the spot. 
um, and gave me so much confidence that the race director actually said that we pros could just drop off our bike in the morning, but I was so confident after they checked it out. I said, this looks fantastic. I put it right on the rack okay. and called it a day. And you went ahead and put your bags up the day before as well? Yeah, I really like to keep things simple. I'm a little bit radical like that. I saw people stuffing their bags with stuff, putting little plastic solo cups so the rain didn't get in, or keeping them in their hotel so they can put them off in the morning, um, special needs and all that. I dropped two really simple bags just to run with shoes and a bike with a helmet that day. That's it. I don't really do much more, and I don't do special needs either. Um, I just, that's me. It's not that I'm, I'm eschewing. I I think, um, some people do Heather Jackson does. Um, but, um, I just like to keep it really simple. So I put those two simple things up on the rack. I didn't care if they got wet. If it was raining, I'd probably be wet. I didn't care. (laughs) Um, some people put a lot of plastic bags and stuff all over their bike when they rack it the night before. I think if it's raining, I'll be wet. Hey, we just swam two and a half miles. We'll probably be wet. I won't care if my saddle's wet. Right. Now, (laughs) being that you're keeping things super simple, walk me through your nutrition plan for the bike ride. Yeah, that's, uh, you're right. That's not quite as simple, but... Another beauty of having a coach is um, Chris and everyone in Chris Bag Coaching, if I might give a plug, um, every single A race for every athlete, they write out a super athlete specific race plan from day before to, to finish. And it includes um, what to eat for that athlete, different for every athlete, um, kind of on the half hour for the whole race. And so I followed, um, I followed the plan there, um, which is largely inspired by QT2 systems and Jesse. Um, and, um, it appreciates power bar, the power bar suite of nutrition. Uh, it, uh, you can sing a song that goes power bar, power bar, gel, 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 power bar, power bar, gel, gel, gel. And that's the way most of the athletes, um, endure the whole bike. And then, um, into the run, we start to depart from each other. And I kind of always keep nutrition in my mouth throughout the whole run nonstop. Okay. And yeah. Now, did you have an ideal number of calories per hour you were willing to hit? I'm sure my coach did. And I'm sure he did that math. I have no idea. Okay. That's, he's smarter than I am. I'm not so good with the math. So I follow the plan, and I'm sure he did that math. But um, uh, I did hit it. I did watch my watch, and I've got it all there on my bike. So Okay. Yeah. Now, to kind of talk about more of the gear that you have, we already talked about the kind of bike you're using. Do you have a certain kind of power meter or cadence sensor or gear that you want to use? Uh, I have the coolest thing, Terry. It's called a Pioneer Power Meter. And it's so cool because uh, it gives you super accurate power. It reads every millisecond and micro turn uh, on the bike. Um, But one thing really cool that Pioneer does is it measures both your left and your right pedaling output um, to keep it even, which is better for training too. Um, But the Pioneer is um, just such a cool and accurate measurement of your watts an output there that I have a screen locked down where, um, I look at my average Watts and my heart rate and a little bit cadence, uh, just to make sure I'm not slowing down too much there. Um, but that's the beauty of the pioneer. I'll tell you what I never look at in terms of gear and measurement on race day is the clock time. It doesn't matter what your time is. It's time and speed. I, and pace on the run, I think is 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 rather irrelevant um, because of conditions and courses being so different. Um, you know, if anyone went out to Lake Placid trying to pace their typical marathon, they're in for a surprise. <laughs> Use the Placid. Um, on the bike in Placid, you could stare down your speed, but that's going to be a little wonky considering there's a screaming descent from Placid into Keene Valley. That's probably going to mess everything up. Um, and so um, the pioneer and looking at um, 
looking at watts was was the key to navigating such a gnarly course like placid okay now you're using the live bike with the power meter on there you mentioned something about the wheels at race day wheels did you have to have a certain depth wheel that you wanted to use for this race yeah so i i don't bank that much as i i keep saying i'm not that strong i'm i'm pretty light and so i don't like deep dish wheels for me personally because i get blown around it's super windy super windy and placid thank god i only had 404s i say only but um i'm quite fond of my my sponsorship with um a wheel company called rolf prima wheel systems really? they're out of eugene oregon and um that not a lot of people have heard of them on the east coast which is a shame because they're just the coolest company the sourcing is as in the u.s as is physically possible to to manufacture a wheel and i've gotten um the opportunity to get to know the people there and go to the factory and watch them actually build the wheels i actually got to help put decals on them once and so i'm gonna always be um loyal to that company for the rest of my life okay that makes sense now the day before the race, are you going to get a certain meal in to prepare you for the race? Oh, yeah. This, I love to see um, either Chris Bag coaching group athletes on course or QT2 systems athletes on course because on course because I always want to say hey how was your pancake breakfast yesterday <laughs> <laughs> um Chris Bag coaching encourages um a classic carbo load for breakfast um the morning before um and it's um basically a burst your stomach type of carbo load uh it's pretty fun they don't um he doesn't necessarily espouse that huge carbo load the night before like the classic pasta the night before but that breakfast is key and then just kind of and it's it's like bursting your stomach with carbohydrates um complex simple carbohydrates anything um and then keeping it pretty carb snacky throughout the day um uh, just a kind of constant um maintenance of the carb load the day before everything simple not a single vegetable in sight Okay. Not a single piece of fruit. No roughage. <laughs> no roughage. Gotcha. So you get your big breakfast of the day before the race. You go ahead, check your bike in. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you basically are off your feet for the most part. Yep. I call it the race back to the hotel. Um, if you're staying in a hotel or a house. Um, it's kind of like on Saturday morning, you win. If you do your stuff and you get back to the hotel and to put your feet up as early as possible. Um, so which is hard because a lot of people get distracted at the expo and dropping their stuff off and seeing people they know and dropping bags off. It's so fun. It's so celebratory, especially in Placid. Um, so I just, um, I try to wake up and think, okay, today is the race until, um, I'm coming back to the hotel and feed up and watching the Bourne trilogy or something. Okay. Now, do you have an ideal time that you want to go to bed the night before the race to kind of go ahead and get into the mood of the yeah. race? Yeah, I do that. I, I have an ideal time um, the night the night before the night before. I know that's a pretty classic adage, um, which is largely the design to protect you from freaking out if you can't sleep the night before a race. Um, but um, I shoot for 8 p.m. the night before the night before and the night before and if it's not if you're not falling asleep then i need to you know watch tv or do sleep read or something that's not like getting on instagram or something hyper inducing then that's fine but legs up and on the bed at, at 8 p.m that's my goal so you're not worrying about the weather or any of that crap try not to <laughs> try <laughs> yeah so you wake up on the morning of the race how much sleep did you get this one I got a ton because I, I swear I was I had the least anxiety going into this one than anything I can remember in the past. Um I bet I got six hours. Really? Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. Um took a while to get get down and then I had to wake up at three thirty, of course. Um 
But um, yeah, it was pretty successful this time. Okay. Now you're getting everything ready. What's your race day morning ritual like before you leave where you're staying at? Yeah. Um, the tattoos, Terry, they take so long. The temporary tattoos takes like a half an hour, man. We've got our numbers. I like to put Wadi Yank tattoos on my legs. I like to put Chris Bag coaching and tower bar and you've got to put a P on your <laughs> calf. Um, so what I do is I love to multitask anyway in, um, in my regular life. So I wake up and go right to the bathroom, start putting my race day tattoos on while I'm eating breakfast in the bathroom, multitasking. Okay. Now, as you're getting everything ready and you're heading to leave to go to the venue, what time do you leave where you're staying to go to the venue? When a race director um, announces the earliest time transition opens, I usually try to take advantage of that. I think if transition is open this early, I should try to get down there then because who knows, maybe you have a flat tire. Um, I feel like I bet you feel this way in your athletes too. race day morning. Once your bike is set, that that's the most important part. So I feel like everyone just is like beelining to their bicycles because they're babies, you know, like got to pump the tires, make sure I don't have a flat tire, make sure there's no brake rub. Um, and so, um, after I leave the hotel, it's basically like a beeline to my bicycle. Other races are shuttles, like a point to point. Um, Placid is so cool because it's just all right there. I think I walked 500 meters to the entrance of the expo. Pretty lucky. Okay. Now I know we're going to jump ahead by asking this, but were you given two red bands to wear for volunteers? You know, they never gave them to me. I picked out my volunteers, but I never got the bands, but I picked them out. <laughs> okay. Because yeah, that's one of the things I'm going to probably start asking athletes yeah. that I have on here is, what did the volunteer do that yeah. you gave the band to, you know? Because yeah, did isn't it right? the best? You know, everyone always sounds so hokey when they say, I'd like to thank the volunteers and everything, but let me put it this way. So I don't t sound too schmaltzy. There are no volunteers, no race. There would be no race without volunteers. Nothing. Couldn't even, couldn't even get through the swim. Um, and so they're, they're, probably the most important staff on that day. The race director could fly out of town. The race would still happen. Yep. Mike Riley could not show up. The race would still happen, the announcer. Um, but no volunteers, no race. And so when they do special stuff, it's so above and beyond that um, you got to recognize that as a chief, a chief benefit to the race. Um, and so um, I, there were, there were two that, that helped me out in particular. Um, one um, I didn't even see got my mom into the finish line shoot and enabled her to put my medal on me. So that was so special. <laughs> and a volunteer made that happen. Um, and then, um, you know, this is so silly, but the ones who take your bike uh, when you get off the bike um, and know, and you just like can give it to them. I think I have a soft spot for that person always because I don't like the bike leg. <laughs> so the suit, the, as soon as I get off my bike, I'm so happy. I see who's going to take it. I do cyclocross so I can do a cyclocross mount and I shove my bike at this random man who I will forever love because he took my bike away from me that day. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the next time I volunteer at the bike dismount, I'm going to go ahead and make signs mm -hmm. that says, we will buy your bike for $2 or something <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right there. And, exactly. I mean, it will make somebody laugh, I'm sure. Yeah. Now that we're actually at the actual race time, you've already left transition. You've walked the half mile on the carpet down to the race start at yeah. Mirror Lake, wonderful Mirror Lake. The last five minutes before the gun goes off, where's your head at? Uh, I'm always so nervous because, you know, I look to my left and right, and these are the best professional women in the world. 
you know, it wasn't, it was like a little sampling of a Kona lineup at Placid. And Terry, I just think, what am I doing here with these women? And so I'm usually pretty nervous uh, at that point, um, just because of where I am in the sport. Um, but Placid was so exciting that I just, I, I, I got to eat away a lot of that anxiety because on one side of me was my dad. On the other side was my mom. I had other family around there. Great friend, Heather Jackson right there. Great new friend, Liz. Stuff like great friend, Lenny, all right there. It felt more like a family fun day this time at Placid. So that was pretty Okay. So the gun goes off. How does a swim go for you? Oh, yeah, it was bifurcated. Dichotomous. It's like I had two swims. Because there are two laps, you know, you get up out of the water. Our first lap, awesome. Now, we didn't get to wear wetsuits. Um, Age groupers did. So that did slow me down. But miraculously, I had people to swim with. So the whole first lap, I was sticking with like a chase chase group, which is pretty good for me. Um, And I was kind of like, this is going to be great. Like, maybe I'll break, break an hour again, even though I'm not in a wetsuit. And I got out. Uh, for the second lap felt great. I'm like, I'm sticking with these girls. We jump back in, in the middle of the back of the pack for the rest of the race. And it was over. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. I lost those girls. I didn't know where I was. There were people breaststroking. Um, I couldn't find a line. I think my second lap was eight minutes slower than my first lap. Um, so it was, uh, the swim was different first lap to second lap, but mirror lake is so beautiful. I didn't get too cold despite not having a wetsuit. Very slow time for me. Um, I, I tried to break an hour and I got like a one Oh seven or something, but you know, I was happy to get out of the water. It was pretty great. Okay. Now, once you get out of the water, you didn't have a wetsuit. Did you have a speed suit? Yep, had a speed suit. Um, I wore a speed suit for my kit. Um, and then I had a, a swim skin, Blue 70, over it um, for the compressive uh, nature. Uh, so easy to take off. Um, so that's the only benefit to not wearing a wetsuit. Um, but, man, I'm, I'm so in love with this new getup. So um, Wadi Inc. Um, makes a awesome speed suit that's a short sleeve speed oriented triathlon specific race day kit um with a little chamois that's been wind tunnel tested it's just it's just the best and um it even the way wadi inc has designed it is it has a classic jersey zip and it opens a little bit at the stomach even though it's a one piece it's still sewn in the back real sleek um but it gives you that kind of hybrid option should you want to open it up on the run or even under your swim skin or something like that great great piece of gear wow now you make the half mile run to T1. You're there yeah. just a few moments after Heather Jackson and Jeanette leaves. Mm-hmm. How was your mentality at this point? Did you know where you were in the race? Did you have an idea where you wanted to be versus where you were? What was that like? <laughs> Yeah, I knew going into the race that I could be a last place pro at any given time in the race. And I was okay with that. I had made, you know, amends with that. Um, and I thought I was actually last out of the water. Um, but but I had a huge smile on my face because I saw some family there. That's just such a buoy. You don't care if you're in last place. If you see family there, it's just so wonderful. And then the tell, tell, telltale sign for me in my racing is when you go to the rack. And because our racks are always separate, so you can see how many bikes are there. And I have been in races before where mine is the only bike, and it's easy to find, but that tells me where I am. But I was pleasantly su- surprised to see that there were like four other bikes there. So I was like, oh, other bikes here. Great. So, now, I worked at the bike station last year at Placid. I was a uh, volunteer of many hats last year because yeah. of how I was doing things awesome. there with one of the race organizers. But we were actually getting the bikes off the racks for the age group athletes. Yeah. I'm not sure if they did that for the pros last year, but did they do that for y'all this year? I don't think so, but it didn't matter because a, I we're so lucky. We got our, our rack was right by exit and B there were only like 18 of us who even started and we were all so spread out that it was just a matter of, 
taking it right off okay. of of the bar. That makes so sense. Okay. Well, so now that you're actually on the bike ride, I know that you are going to tackle that first two little hills, one going out of transition and then another one right there coming out. That's about a little bit longer. And then you have yeah. the left turn before you actually start getting out of town. How did you prepare for that turn so close into the start of the bike ride? Good memory. Uh, first thing, make sure you're in the right gear. Um, there's a little descent right out of transition. And I did something new, which was I actually didn't keep my shoes on my bike. I actually just put them on. So I wasn't fumbling with them right out of transition. I liked that. Um, that was good. And then the key with any, any race where there's uphills of any size right at the beginning the key is to hold your horses. You got 112 miles left. Like <laughs> in 100 miles, you're not going to be mashing up any hill. And so, what I do is um, on early, early hills in any race, I keep an eagle eye on my power and I keep it chill or keep it at the prescribed power. Just watch it, watch it. Cause you know, you've got so much adrenaline pumping. I could have gone up hills at 300 Watts. That wouldn't have been smart. So I just eagle eye on those early hills and make sure that corners, descents, up hills, you just keep it steady like you will in 80 miles, you know? Okay. Now with this bike ride, did you have a certain strategy of what kind of power cadence or heart rate that you wanted to hit? for certain points of the race or certain distances or what were you wanting to hit there as far as a data perspective? Yep. A hundred percent prescribed by my coach. Um, a hundred percent. And it, he based it on both laps and said, first lap hit these numbers. Second lap hit these numbers, this number. Um, and, um, he had me a little higher on the second lap. As we, most of us, as many of us do, I messed it up and went higher on the first lap and lower on the second lap, but not too much. And there was some weather change there. So um, I tried to lock it in, but it was power based and lap based. Okay. Now the power that you were wanting to hit, was that a normalized power? Um, no, um, but it was average. You kind of glance at the three second. And then when you hit lap, um, and when you see the average, it's going to look a little bit more like normalized power because it spread out over 56 miles. Um, and then later in the analysis, um, my coach will certainly look at normalized power, but I just actually looked at raw average. Okay. Now going into this race, were you looking at using the best bike split or something like that to give you the best power analysis or anything like that? Um, no, because, um, I got to tell you, honestly, um, I, I firmly believe that my husband is a genius in terms of, um, bike and numbers coaching. Um, he coaches some elite uh, cyclists, and um, he's got a, I have a lot of data I've provided him um, from workouts and everything. And so um, it was, I just, it's all in the hand of my coach and um, he's got a lot of experience there. Okay. Now, knowing that, did you want to hit a certain percentage of your FTP? Is that the way this was working for you? Yeah. FTP based. Okay. Yep. And prior races. Yep. So what kind of percentage were you wanting to hit here? Yeah, you know, he did the math. I think it was about uh, 75, 80%. Um, and then um, looking at prior races too, um, kind of like, okay, well, you just had these good half iron ran races, so don't go that hard. Um, you know, you kick it back about 10 notches, and um, that helped as well. Now, did y'all have an idea of how to adapt for weather? No, the one adaptation my coach makes is ensuring I don't rely on heart rate because, you know, it was so cold that day and rainy that if I looked at my heart rate, it would be wonky. Um, and then, um, you know, throwing out, you know, descents, that would be looking at normalized power, but stretching it out over 56 miles and giving me a range of power to hit, um, that's kind of um, leaves wiggle room for different conditions. Okay. Now, as far as the aid stations on this bike course goes for y'all, how was that? Oh, just phenomenal. You said it yourself, Terry. 
the the so well oiled at Lake Placid. They know what they're doing. There's not there's so much support out there that I skipped multiple age stations just because there was so much um, flawless, flawless. Okay. Now with the road quality here, did you see that many flats? You know, I didn't. And they say that there were no crashes. It's pretty really? strange. Yeah. They said there were two tumbles at aid stations and it was raining and hailing. So I think it was a great day for bikes out there. Okay. Now you don't use the special needs for the bike course. How does the second loop go versus the first loop for you? Oh, it was dreadful. Um, that's mainly because, um, since I'm a relatively slow cyclist at that point, almost every woman had passed me. So it just feels, it feels desperate. It feels pointless to continue. Cause I just sense that they're getting farther and farther away. Why am I even racing? I'll never catch them on the run. Um, but man, like 10 years of experience doing this, I usually make some leeway on the run and I just have to believe Every time. So first lap, it's like you're excited. You're kind of in the race a little bit. Relatively, I'm not at the front. Um, second lap is always dreadful for me because I'm kind of like they're so far up the road. I'll never even see them again. Why am I out here? Um, but every time I have to learn lessons. Mentally, this has to be very discouraging. I mean, because yeah. this isn't your first time as a pro at a race it like this. And time after time, you're getting your ass handed to you in yeah. a sense. So yeah. how are you dealing with this mentally during the race? Uh, one, uh, in one word, the run. Um, I think it would also be tough if the run was not an athlete's, you know, about this strongest suit and the whole day that athlete had to know that came last. So I'm lucky because I have that to look forward to as much as you can look forward to it. <laughs> um, but um, I have to, um, I have to play back old races in my head. And when I'm out there and it's dreadful, I'm freezing. I'm nowhere near anyone. I just have to say, remember France, remember Cabo, remember Kona, remember Tremblant, remember Italy, and uh, that's that helps. Were you having any negative self talk in the later miles of the bike ride? Say like eighty to ninety in those dark places. How did you know? Were you inside my head mm. right then mm, at that point? How did you guess? Yeah, it was dreadful. You know, it just feels hopeless, and it was so cold, and um, I was getting a little slower. And, um, feeling like I'm, I'm dead last, you know, I was with someone else, but we were dead last and, um, it makes you want to say I quit. It certainly would be comfortable to quit. Um, help that my family was there. Cause it's kind of like, no, you got to go do this. Your family's here. Um, and then that whole, like, remember France, remember Cabo, remember Italy that helped. Okay. Now, I'm sure that at some point you have to go a little bit deeper than just remember these races, remember your families yeah. here because I know I've been in these spots before where, you know, I think they'll be okay with me just pulling the plug. You know? Yeah. They'll be yeah. okay if I de yeah. because, hey, look, this is a really phenomenal feat in itself just to get here. Yeah. But, you know, it, you have to go a little bit deeper of why you're even doing this. Yeah. So why it's do you do good. this? It's true. And it's a good point. And, you know, my dark place on the run is I look down and I realize I wasn't even going to break six hours. That's like where I was like 10 years ago. Like to me, and to me, that equals one word, which is embarrassment. And I think a lot of athletes, when they say they wouldn't mind if I quit, maybe I'll pull off here. Maybe my ankle hurts. Maybe that injury won't. I think athletes are trying to avoid shame and embarrassment. For me, I, I felt very embarrassed that I was about to get a, over a six-hour ride. You know, that was embarrassing to me. Um, and so almost more than the physical and mental, the, the physical part, I feel like athletes have to turn off their negative talk that has to do with shame. And um, I think that um, 
it has to do with my experience and being a little bit older and it's just confidence and not having to prove myself that keeps me out there. I think if I were younger, a little bit more insecure and felt like I had to prove myself, that's when the nests happen. That's when you don't get off the bike or don't start the run. I heard her heard a woman say, Oh, I was throwing up a little on the bike. So I didn't even try to run. And I kind of thought, Hmm, that's not good enough. <laughs> like, there's more going on there. I think you were below, you were late on your time, and that's shameful, and it feels awful. But um, you, you got to keep going. And experience has shown me um, that um, shame doesn't matter. You, you know, you, you got to go try to surprise yourself, and it will probably happen. Okay. Now, you get through these dark places on the bike ride, and you're – Getting to T2, how are the last few miles of the bike ride? Are you doing anything to prepare to start running? Yeah. Um, so I always, I don't factor in the last mile of the run or the last like three miles of the bike into my math because they're so exciting. They're like free miles. And in Placid, once you start to approach town, it starts to get like, you know, Crazy. super crowd. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. And so I had the biggest smile on my face when I, you know, about three miles out of T- T2. And I was, I really wanted to get off the bike. So I was already smiling. And again, a lot of my family was there. So, so that really helped. Um, and um, the only thing I do to prepare is do a little check. Like, how is your nutrition? Do you need to do something? Um the only thing um, I think about uh, is um, nutrition. Like, let's not forget to stay nutriented um, as you make this transition to transition and through transition. Because uh, I think people do. They get excited, and then it's teeth too. Then they start running, and a mile later, like, shoot, I haven't eaten or drinking in like a half an hour. Um, and then the other thing that sounds trite, but it's a kind of a big deal, is shoes. Um, I like, I like to ride in barefoot and I like to cycle across, hop off my bike. Um, and so you got to start thinking, Oh wait, you can't do that. An uphill. How does the approach look like? Should I start getting barefoot now? And I got barefoot in the middle of town, maybe a little too early and rode through town barefoot, but that's fine. Um, that's it. Okay. Now you get to T2. How does T2 go for you? Pretty quick and just a little under two minutes or just a little over two minutes rather. How does that work for you? Thank you. I thought I had an awesome T2. I don't know where those, oh, I know where the two minutes came. They make you like run back and forth yep. and remember that whole thing. But uh, I was pretty stoked about this. And the volunteers, you know, you just rip off your helmet and they help you with everything. And I, I, I got right out. I have a trick. It's Amy VT's secret weapon. In my run bag, I keep a Ziploc bag. And it's got everything I need for the run in it. So I don't put it on, you know, I like to keep things simple. I'm not there like putting stuff on in transition. I just grab and I put on my shoes and I grab and go. Then as I'm running, I put on my number bell. I like take it out. It's like Christmas, like, oh, glasses. Oh, a headband. Oh, my number bell. That's important. (laughs) Oh, gels. That's important. Uh, And so that's my little trick. Okay. Now, you get out to the run. How did the first few miles of the run go? They're always awful, aren't they? They're, exci- they're exciting because of, of like, Placid. One, one group had this, like, pumping music at that hot turn, downhill, uphill. Um, so exciting. Um, so for me, I just like you asked on the bike, what I need to do is keep an eagle eye on my watch and be like, let's not start doing like sub six miles here, which I've done before. <laughs> like, and so you gotta just, you can't get too caught up in the crowd. So I try to keep an eagle eye on my watch and make sure I'm not doing anything crazy. Like just keep it chill. These should be your slowest miles in theory. Um, so that was fun and under control, I think. Okay. Now, at this point, did you have an idea of where you were in the race in regards to the leader? Leader, my friend Heather. Um, I don't care where I am in comparison with her. Um, I was hoping to verify that she was winning because that's very important to me as a friend. Um, but um, that wasn't, you know, my only hope on that day would be to place 
you know, at least top 10. And so that was the important litmus for me. Um, and I didn't think it would be even close to possible to get close to top 10 at that point. I thought that I would be second to last or last as I started the run. Okay. Now, as you approach the middle miles, if you kind of look at this run course on a map, you see that it's almost like a big smiley face. And yeah. you go from left to right, and then you go back down to the left and then back over to the right, then finish on the left side. That's yeah. basically, in a sense, how it goes. All the hills are over there on the left side, and it's pretty much flat for the most part on the right side. Yeah. How is it over on the right side? Because even though it's flat, the other aspect of it is it's challenging because there's really no support over there. Right. Yeah, you're so right. It's it's a little death, and it's also monotonous. And so you make a turn and you think, is that, is there a turnaround around here somewhere? <laughs> like my, my, a million dollars for a turnaround, please, anyone. Or you, I can't see the ski jump anymore. Um, it's hard, but um, it starts to get more stimulating because you see more people. You know, on the bike, you can't see that double traffic. And at that point, I started to see more like where I was with the women. Um, and so it got more stimulating that way. Okay. Now, as you come back onto the left side of the course, you're starting to hit some of those hills on very tired and fatigued legs by this point, I'm mm -hmm. sure. How were, how was your strategy to attack those hills? Yeah, um, to not care about time or pace at all at all heart rate at that point um just kind of lock in a heart rate and if it means you're shuffling uphill that's fine because you're a big risk it's like always balancing teetering on this like you kind of go as fast as you can up the hill but keep it chill so you're not walking by the end of the marathon um so i went kind of as steady as i could and again the eagle eye on my heart rate at that point not pace Okay. Are you using wrist-based heart rate or just a chest strap? Just a chest strap. Um, and um, I just glance at it on the bike, but on, on the run, on a course like Placid, it's a good default because pace is going to be out out the window at Placid. Right. You're just going downhill too much, yeah. A little off subject, and I know a lot of women that I've had on here – complain about the chest straps and yeah. it will with the bra that women wear yep it will just chafe a hole in their side or in their yeah. ribs how do you combat that um i don't want i want to give credit to those women i and i know everyone's shaped differently too so it could be that as well um but um i wear a heart rate strap every single day of my life um for a lot of hours and so i think um i i I think some women maybe start to chafe and they wear it less because it chafes and then they wear it less or they skip workouts with it. Um, but I think conversely, you have to wear it more. Maybe it builds up some strength, like tough skin or something like that. And um, so I think um, I approach that by just wearing it more so that I, I guess I develop tougher skin or something. I have scars. We all do. It's kind of part of it. It's kind of like when some race competitors say, well, I don't like gels and I don't like power bars or I don't like Gatorade. I can't really do that. It's kind of like try to push through it because that's part of the sport. I mean, you can't say I don't like running. You know, you, you, no one does. You can't say um, I don't, you know, that hurts there. You just um, I just bring on the chafing as part of it. Right. I mean, that's almost like saying, you know, instead of doing these nutrition plans that all these coaches lay out, I'm just going to bring some sweet potatoes to the bike ride. You know, that sounds good. Right, because that's part of it, and that's that's throwing out what you hired your coach for. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So, towards the second loop of the bike, or bike ride, <laughs> towards the second loop of the run, did you have a different way that you wanted to approach that? Because at this point you had already been passed by a few of the age group men and okay. that was starting to take another mental blow basically on mm -hmm. top of the fatigue 
and the stress of almost losing the all the women on top of the yeah. men passing you. Yeah. And that's got to be a little bit hard. I've talked with a yeah. uh, rookie pro a few times on here, and they talk about losing to people 40 minutes ahead of them, and they just can't – they don't understand how to deal with this mentally. How do you deal with yeah. that? Yeah. Um, and, and may I say that women too, women age groupers as well. Um, and I see them out there and, and they started behind me in the swim. So there's that, you know, and that gets back to that shame and identity factor that I was talking about before. Um, um, for me, fortunately at this point on the run, um, there, you know, PR and time, like my coach would have rather, I got like a 310, 315 marathon that was out the window getting top 10 was out the window. So why do I keep running? What am I doing? There's no PR, there's no placement. But um, at this point on this run, I saw because of all the out and backs, I saw, oh, you know what, I think I might be able to run up to the next girl. Actually, there's enough time. And then that turned into like two more. And so that certainly kept me going. Um, so I was fortunate to have people to race without there. If I was all alone, no one was anywhere near me. I don't know what I would have done, Terry. It's so kind of po- feels pointless, but I, I did have that race going on. So, okay. Now, did you have any cramping or GI issues on this run? Miraculously? No, I have been plagued with bad GI issues in the past. Bad, like several minutes or more and so much discomfort. Um, and my coach has gotten radical the past two races with me. And this one was like no GI issues. And I am elated. This is the best thing that happened from this race by far. Okay. Now, as far as the support in the course, I know on the left side of the run course, there are tons and tons of people. They're all on the lake. They're all on the hill. They're literally everywhere on the left side. Did you see anything that was so funny that you almost laughed or did laugh? <laughs> yeah, I did. It's always so fun out there. There's crazy stuff going on. Um, my two funniest things were from fellow com- fellow participants. Really? Um, yeah. One participant was in head to toe spandex. You couldn't see like orange man. You couldn't see his eyeballs head to toe orange, like couldn't see his hands, couldn't see his feet, just some orange suit. I don't know what was going on there. And then my other one was, um, oh, there were two guys who, um, who were naked. That was pretty distracting. Those were spectators. Um, but then um, one guy on the second loop, so he was, I'm sure he was starting his first loop, he stopped in the middle of the run, pulled out the lacrosse ball that apparently he had been carrying with him on the run, lay down on the ground and started rolling out his cramps with his lacrosse ball. <laughs> wow. Didn't even pull over to the side, just the middle of the street. That was pretty funny. Wow. Now... Mentally, looking back on it, how hard was this race in comparison to other races you've done? Um, I think mentally it was not hard compared to other races because of where I personally was. I think um, course-wise, this is one of the last vestiges of hard Ironman courses left in the world by far. So mentally, I think um, I think I kind of nailed this one. Ironic, because look how horrible, relatively, my clock time was, um, which shows you how hard the course was, which is cool. That makes sense. Now, the last two miles of the run, how was that? I always, I think I told you before, I don't count the last yeah, mile. You, you don't count them. <laughs> Three. <sighs> And it was down, kind of downhill, you know, so that is pretty free. Um, The second to last, you know, I, um, I won, I had, I pulled into 11th place at this point from 15th, I think. And so I wondered if someone was kind of on my tail going to respond. And so it was hard because I had to keep it up. My legs were hurting for sure. And I was trying to keep it up. Uh, cause you don't want to turn around, you know? Um, and, um, and then I had this, I had this question 
could it pass my friend Carly was in 10th place. And I thought it's possible that she slowed down a lot and it's possible I could run into 10th place, which was also the money by the way. And so I kept, I kept the gas on the pedal and it was hard because I was like, now I'm in the race. Like I want to see if I can get 10th. Maybe she slowed down and I want to keep that girl off of me. So it was hard. Gotcha. Now you hit the split where you can go on the second loop or go into the oval. You get into the oval. How was that? Isn't it the best? I just got chills. It's just the best. Um, talk about free miles. I don't think anyone feels anything physically going in there. It's all emotional. It's roaring. It's historic. The crowd is roaring. The location is historic. Um, my family was left and right. Um, I started to like fist pump like I was like winning the race, even though I was in 11th. Like I was just so excited. It was great. Um, and then my mom was behind the finish line, got to medal me. It was so exciting. I knew Heather Jackson won. So I was just excited for the day. And it's so exciting that um, all of us, including Heather, uh, we went back at 1130 p.m. Uh, to see where the real magic happens in that oval, which is with those final finishers. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, after you cross the finish line, what do you do next? Um, sometimes I think, ooh, do I need an IV here? Because <laughs> there are free IVs right over there in that medical tent. Um, but my family was there. It's so easy to forget to eat and drink after an Ironman because the race is over, right? What do you, you know, and you feel kind of gross, you know how it is. And so recently I've been working on forcing, forcing it in anything that sounds good, anything. And so it might mean being a little bossy, which I hate to people around like, yeah, I'll take that. Or could you get me that? Or could I get a water? Um, and so that's been my game plan. Um, another game plan for me has been trying to not sit down keep it going. Um, and I'm a very social person. So I'm also always going to do a cursory glance around to see, Oh, where are my friends? Where's Heather? Where's Jen? Where's Lenny? Um, and, uh, for that little post celebration, especially cause, um, Placid was all women's. I thought that could be cool. We had our little women's finishers, little finish line celebration. Um, so I kept moving, I kept drinking and I socialized. Okay. Were you there for the champagne uh, extravaganza no i didn't make it in i was too slow oh. i didn't see him yeah so okay. if you could change one thing about this race and do it again what would you change you know i wish i could change the clock time i wish it could, i could have just miraculously been an hour faster that would be more in keeping with where i feel like i should be but that's, that is not possible. I feel like I did logistically everything well. Um, I feel like if I could change one thing, it would be to back up even more, making sure my bike mechanics are okay before the race. Because that was the one hiccup there was. It was fine on race day, but no one wants to deal with that. And here I am. I told you I came here like, over a week early to make sure everything was okay. And it still wasn't. And so um, I don't think anyone can slack on making sure their bike is in top tune as early as possible before any race. Okay. So what's something that you learned about this race experience that you'd want to pass on to someone who hasn't done this race before? This one in particular, do it. Um, hardest course in North America arguable against Hawaii, Kona, apples and oranges. That one's humid. This one's hilly. Do it. It is the most fun full Ironman experience in on this continent. I'm convinced. Um, and when you do it, put a, some duct tape over any, any of your screenshots that show your time or pace or speed. Those are irrelevant at Placid. Gotcha. Now, for first timers that are competing this race next year, what advice would you give them? Same thing. Um, first timers, you get special props. Someone should give two medals to first timers who also do their first one at Placid. That's double gutsy. 
um awesome to them they rock um so um th- like if a first timer just wants to finish and they finish placid they can do anything because this one's the hardest one so good on them um you picked a good one okay we covered a lot do you have anything else to add about your race you know this one i i i i love the interview process with someone as astute as you are because it's always introspective as well and I honestly didn't do as much post-mortem about my own race as I have right now with you so I really appreciate that and I recognize some themes that came up for me which is um you know you talked a lot about my mental headspace during the race and all of us and um that's going to be a work in progress for every athlete out there from um, Rachel Joyce to um, Jan Frodeno to a first timer. Everyone has to combat with that. And um, the more you can believe and know that it's your individual experience and not a, some stupid clock time or qual- qualification for a world championship or how you do in your age group or what place you came in. Cause that just is so arbitrary depending on who showed up, but your own journey and your own, how well you did that day. That's what measures success on race day. I had a very slow time. I didn't even make the top 10, but now that I have this interview with you, I realized I did everything right. I'm pretty proud of myself. It was a great race. Good. Now, moving forward, what's next for you? I have another Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray! Uh, in three weeks, I'm doing Iron Man Montrom Want. Um, so that's coming right around the corner. And I think I've practiced the art of the swim, bike, run in those distances. So it'll be great. Okay. Now, what races are on your bucket list? Oh, yeah. That's a good question. Um, I love crazy different races. Um, I will definitely be doing Ultraman again at some point. Very hard to work into a schedule. Um, but so in the meantime, a bucket list for me is getting to some of those cool exotic locations, like maybe in Asia or the Middle East, something like that, because I haven't done that yet. So watch out, world. I want to head over there. Awesome. So how can athletes follow you? Oh, Instagram, because I'm a slacker on Facebook and Twitter. (laughs) 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 Um, My Instagram feed is Amy Van Tassel, and um, uh, I'm sometimes active there, but um, that's where I like to be the most active. And I have a couple sponsors that I love because they're totally grassroots, um, and so I love to talk about them and uh, talk about food and adventuring and everything like that. So Okay. Well, I only have two questions left for you. And one is, if you could tell every triathlete one message, what would you want to tell them? This should be fun. If it stops being fun, something is wrong. It will be hard, but if you're miserable, change something. Okay. Now, this is the last question. What's your definition of a perfect race? I love the name of your podcast because it made me think before talking to you, perfect race, there's no such thing. Why did he name his podcast that? But you're so right. That's what we're all looking for. Um, The definition of the perfect race is knowing that you didn't succumb to the wrong ideals. The wrong ideals, which is clock time, how you placed, if you qualified for something, or if you got a certain speed or time or something like that. Those are irrelevant measurements when you look at a perfect race. A perfect race is knowing that you didn't give up. You didn't give up in a microsecond where you're like, oh, I know I'm supposed to eat that gel, but I don't care. Or, oh, I'm going to pass her because she looks wrong or something your perfect race is if you stayed proud and true to yourself the whole time and ignored those factors has nothing to do with time or qualification okay so you're placing a higher value on intrinsic rewards versus extrinsic rewards that's way better put i should have just said that (laughs) yes 
<laughs> awesome. Well, Amy, I've really enjoyed having you on here, and I look forward to following you next month at Montreblant, and I can't wait to see you there. I might, I might be there, but we'll see. Oh. Might. That's a big might right now, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, look forward to it, and good luck if I don't talk to you until then, but we will talk soon, okay? Sweet. Thank you awesome. so much. Have a good day. Okay. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you were able to learn something from today's episode. If you enjoy the show, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to see pictures from this athlete's race, learn more about who I am, what I'm doing, or be on the show yourself to share your story, check out my website at CoachTerryWilson.com. Until next time, continue the pursuit.